It was 1963. It was summertime in New York and I was nine years old. My older brother was 13. And at that time we lived in a county bordering Pennsylvania. It was the only county in the state without an incorporated city. And to this day, it is very remote. It's as far back in the sticks as anyone can get. And if you were to go any further, you would be on your way out. We lived up a dirt road that was miles from any town with a population of even 500. The area consisted of only fields and forests. Of course, there were a lot of wildlife and we were familiar with every species there, or so we thought. One night, my brother and I were on the front lawn. There was no moonlight, which gives you a very ominous feeling, especially when you're a kid in such a rural area. The dead silence added to the strange feelings we were having. Suddenly, the silence was broken when out of the darkness came a blood-curdling scream. Did you hear that? I said. I think we both spoke at the same time. Of course, we knew the other had heard it because you would have to be deaf not to. We were wide-eyed with fright. and That scream was ear-piercing and it was not a short scream. It was terrifying and like nothing I could ever imagine. I struggled to find an explanation because I was the one who usually had the answers to things. My brother had always been a bit slower to figure things out. Therefore, I knew he would be depending on me for an explanation. I took a few minutes to think about it, and I said, maybe it's George up on the letter S road beating his wife. That was the best I could come up with, but it didn't convince my brother. Then we heard the scream again, and my brother said, no, that scream came from the woods across the lake on this side of the stone wall. George lives way past that. I just have to stop here and I've got a question. So George beat his wife and you could guy, you guys could hear him her screaming all that way. Did anybody ever think to go over and beat the shit out of George? Just wondering. All right, let's move on with the story. The scream came the third time and we were utterly, completely terrified. Maybe it's a cougar, I said. That explanation didn't convince him either. He pointed out that there weren't any cougars in the area. What is it then? I asked. If you didn't like any of my suggestions, what is yours? Well, he was of no help because he said he didn't know. And then the screams stopped, and neither of us were going to enter that dark, creepy woods to find out the source. Therefore, I told myself that it must have been a cougar. Perhaps they were coming back into the area and we weren't aware of it. That answer would have to suffice for now because there was no other explanation, and for many years I held on to that belief. We never spoke of it after that or mentioned it to our parents. I think we were too afraid to even give it any more thought. In our minds, it was best if we just left the matter alone. It is unimaginable how terrified someone can become when this happens. I hadn't forgot it, and I still wanted an answer. And finally, with the help of the internet, I started to do some research. And now, I'm entirely convinced that it was neither a woman screaming or a cougar. Thank God, George wasn't beating his wife again. That's all I've got. That's, that's the thing that makes me the happiest about this story. <laughs> Based on the descriptions and recordings that I had heard online, I'm now sure that it was a Sasquatch. Neither my brother nor I have heard anything even remotely like we had heard on that night many years before. I'm thankful that neither of us chose to investigate the source of those terrifying screams. The outcome probably would have been a good one. Now, the writer has another story here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that with you. The following event is something I will never forget. I remember the date because it was the day before my grandfather's birthday party, it was in mid-February 2007. I left the golf course at 5 p.m. The western horizon was bright yellow by the soon-to-be setting sun. I looked to my left and observed a shape silhouette against the sky that was approaching from the southwest. If it was a bird, it certainly was a weird-shaped one with a strange appearance. I headed toward the north main highway and continued to watch it as well as I could while driving course as I continued the shape grew larger. I turned left on the main road realizing this was not a bird. 
My mind was overworking as I tried to figure out what this could be. Since this thing was heading in my direction, I pulled off the main highway. It turned slightly toward me and my mouth flew open in astonishment. If someone were to post a photo of my expression at that time, I'm sure it would go viral immediately. How about posting a photo of this bird? That might go viral real quick. Anyway, I keep, I keep getting sidetracked in this story, so excuse me. In my opinion, it was a vehicle that never should have been able to get off the ground, let alone fly. I was only able to see it for a few seconds, but it is ingrained in my memory, and this is how I would describe it. It had the shape of a windowless shuttlecraft from the Starship Enterprise. It had two huge globes, one on each side attached to the exterior of the craft, midway between the front and back. The globes were copper-colored with what looked like black O-ring gaskets around the center of each globe. There was no sound coming from this strange craft, nor was there any wind gust as one might expect as it passed overhead. It went slightly to the north and sped off at treetop level in the direction of Mount Shasta. To my surprise, the traffic was passing by as it would any other time. Was I the only one that could see this? Well, I was wondering what was going on. I got back into my car with my mind spinning and I started home. What had just happened? Why didn't anyone else react? The questions wouldn't stop entering my brain. I couldn't have been the only one that saw this craft since it came right over the main part of town. I returned home and tried to clear my mind or at least make some sense of this experience and I decided to report it to the local police and the local newspaper. To my amazement, not a single person had reported seeing anything out of the ordinary. Since no one had seen anything, I decided to keep it to myself, even though I had a strong feeling of wanting to share this with everyone. I did tell a few people that I knew I could trust, but even to this day, they give me a lot of ribbing and make a lot of jokes about it. Now, finally, I found a place where I can share this event with everyone without being ridiculed. I'm thankful for this opportunity, and I feel a bit of relief being able to do so. So now, maybe I'm not crazy. Well, to the writer, maybe you're not crazy. And uh, I'm so glad that George wasn't killing his wife or beating her again. I don't know why that's sticking in my mind in this story, but it was... uh, It was just, I don't know, it was kind of an odd thing to assume. Oh, that's probably George beating his wife. Nothing to see here. Everybody move along. Anyway, a lot of stuff happened in this story, and uh, for some reason, that's the only thing that sticks in my mind. So, I don't know. It's probably just me. I just thought it was kind of weird. Let's move on to something else. All right, this was an interesting email. Thought I'd share it with you all. My friend and I spent a weekend camping at Rock Lake in Algonquin Park one summer about five years ago. I had no idea what was about to happen. If I had, I know I wouldn't have even gone there in the first place. We were fooling around using my green laser pointer to point at a ton of objects that we observed moving about and at flashing lights in the sky. It appeared that these lights were communicating with each other. After this amazing experience, we hit the tent to sleep. It had two rooms with the front screen porch to keep the bugs out. We settled in for the night and put the fire out and we went to sleep. I woke to the zippers on my tent having been opened. I didn't know what time it was, but it was still pitch black outside. With my eyes closed, I was thinking that it was probably my friend next to me who may have woken to relieve himself. I enjoyed drinking probably a little too much, and we had quite a buzz on. I thought it was him staggering over to the wrong side of the tent, and I heard a long zip and then another long zip. My friend knows that I like to unzip each end of the center and not completely to one side. I could tell from the sound that it was being unzipped how I would prefer it not be unzipped. Oh well, he was drunk, so I didn't expect anything else from him. I said, hey, Brad, wrong side, bro, as I heard the zipping of the tent door opening repeated, but this time louder. Hey, Brad, I said, 
but there was no response, and I opened my eyes. There was the most terrifying sight beyond what I could have even imagined. A creature was crouched down looking in my tent. I thought it was a human at first, but it was staring at my face with huge glowing green eyes. Naturally, I freaked out and slapped the tent floor and ground as hard as I could. Like a bullet, this creature took off into the darkness with branches and things breaking as it thankfully ran off. I have camped solo since then, but not at that place. I can't honestly say what it was, but I have never heard of an animal opening a zipper of a tent. And I tell you what, I was terrified. Until you encounter something like this, you have no idea how you'll react. One thing I do know is that most people would get out of there as soon as physically possible, and that's what we did. It took a little effort to get Brad up and going, but he sobered up quickly, and by the look on my face and the tone in my voice, he had no clue what had just happened. But as I gained my composure, I explained it all to him. I'm not sure if Brad ever believed me, but I know for damn sure what I saw, and this thing was real. Whether he believed me or not, I really don't care. Over the years, thinking about what this thing could have been, I narrowed it down to the cryptozoology category or the ufology category. It was either an alien or an ET entity or an adolescent Sasquatch. My conclusion is that whatever it was, it was curious and only looking at me. It did not harm me, but sure startled the crap out of me. And that's the end of the story. Well, that's interesting. I mean, you you look out the end of your tent, there's these two green eyes looking at you. That would uh, freak me out too, but that's a real interesting story. Thanks to the writer for sending it. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this podcast. Those first two stories were pretty good. There are two more left. They're longer stories. The next one you're going to hear is a multifaceted story about Bigfoot and these interdimensional type things. It's a very credible story. The last story is a creepy pasta thing I did on the What If It's True YouTube channel and podcast. I'm merging all these podcasts together. The next thing I want to talk about is, I don't know if uh, you remember, but if you follow this podcast, a few videos back, I complained that Bluebell Ice Cream had discontinued their salted caramel cookie ice cream a couple of years ago. We've been looking for it ever since, and I was kind of being funny because I know Bluebell brings flavors in and out, and if one of them doesn't sell much, they, they discontinue it and go to something else. It all makes sense. But I actually had a listener. Uh, she sent me an email. I'm just going to read you the email. This is from Patricia. Patricia, thank you for doing this. Dear Cameron, as soon as I finished listening to the video in which you mentioned this yummy sounding ice cream, I went straight to Bluebell's site and I messaged them. I told them about your channel and your love of their salted caramel cookie ice cream and asked for them to please bring it back. What follows is their response. Thank you so much for the channel. I really enjoy it. And here is Bluebell's response to Patricia's message. Thank you for contacting us and for alerting us to the podcast. We wish we had better news, but our salted caramel cookie ice cream is not currently scheduled for production, but we may bring it back again sometime in the future. If the Dixie Cryptid podcast will stay tuned to our website or social media platforms, they will be the first to know of flavor happenings and other Bluebell news. Your input is greatly appreciated, blah, blah, blah. In other words, thanks for sending us a message, but we're not bringing back the salted caramel cookie ice cream. I just thought that was funny that she would actually, on my behalf, send a message to Bluebell because I would never take the time to do that. Because really, I'm not that upset that the salted caramel cookie is not available right now. And I absolutely love Bluebell ice cream. It's all other ice creams are inferior. In the comment section of that video, people were saying, oh, try Briars, try Ben and Jerry's, try Yarnell's, try this. They're all inferior. If you're gonna buy ice cream, don't buy the cheap stuff. That's one of those things that you wanna go ahead and spend the money on. 
I don't eat a whole lot of ice cream, and I cringe when my wife buys a half gallon of Bluebell because I know I'm going to feel terrible for two days because I'm going to eat it like every night until it's gone. So I don't need the ice cream. I'm 60 years old. I'm too fat. I need to get healthier, and I don't need the ice cream. However, if salted caramel came back, I would probably buy a half a dozen half gallon containers of it. So anyway, there's no point to this. I just thought it was a funny thing. And if Bluebell is looking to sponsor a podcast and have a real ambassador out there talking about their product, I'm always available. I have a new Steve Lilly podcast and I'm about to launch and I hope it's going to be a successful podcast. And it would be great to have Bluebell or someone like them as a sponsor. I don't know really how to gather sponsors. I don't know anything about the business end of this podcasting thing. I just record these and throw them up and let the chips fall where they may. But if you're looking to sponsor someone, Bluebell, give me a holla because I believe in your product. It's an awesome, awesome product. And by the way, if you have not subscribed to the Steve Lilly channel, There's going to be a little box, little pull down up here in the right or left hand corner. You can click on it, go subscribe, come back to this video, listen to the rest of it. Or there'll be a subscribe button on the end screen when this video is over. There are no Steve Lilly episodes on that channel yet. I am remastering the Steve Lilly stories 1 through 10. And I'm writing five more to launch the podcast, and it should be done in around 20 to 30 days. I'll let you know when it's launched, but if you subscribe to that channel and you click that bell icon, it'll ring as soon as I launch the whole podcast. All right, enough talking. Let's get into these last two stories. I think you're going to love it. All right, here we go. Here's a story that I've had quite a while, and I'm just getting to it. The man is in his 60s, says he's battling MS, multiple sclerosis, I assume that's what MS means. Now I've just, he, he writes, I've decided to share my experiences before it's too late. Perhaps my encounters will benefit someone, and if so, then my time writing this has not been wasted. I was raised on a farm and cattle operation in Utah in the 1960s and 70s. Our land was adjacent to foothills that led up into a range of the Rocky Mountains where I spent every possible hour on horseback or hiking or backpacking. I logged several hundred nights camping out during my teens and in 20s and my 30s and into my early 40s. It came with the territory of my outdoor life. Being out of doors every day from my childhood onward gave me a tremendous education about the natural world, and I was intimately familiar with every species of tree, plant, wildflower, every type of bird that inhabited our region, and of course every mammal that lived in these valleys and mountains. I grew up fly fishing and hunting waterfowl, upland birds, and big game, which took me into some of the most beautiful and remote country imaginable. I mention these things so you'll understand my familiarity. That's a hard word for me to say. I mention these things so you'll understand my familiarity with every living thing from the western deserts to Utah's red rock country and the alpine peaks of the highest mountains. In all that time spent outdoors, I never had any cause for fear, nor did I see or experience anything unusual. And then one August evening in 2004, my fly fishing partner and I decided to stay out late to watch the, I can't pronounce this word, I think it's Perseid Meteor Shower at Strawberry Reservoir, P-E-R-S-E-I-D, Perseid or Perseid Meteor Shower at Strawberry Reservoir. We were excited to see the spectacle because of clear skies. There was no moonlight and no light pollution. We launched our float tubes into the water shortly before dark to enjoy some fishing and stargazing. Perhaps an hour into the meteor shower, we both suddenly noticed something massive walking along the shoreline on all fours. 
Its silhouette instantly reminded me of a polar bear with a huge hindquarters, taller than its front shoulders, and its head was small for its body size, and that body was gargantuan. We were way too close to the shore for comfort, and we paddled into the safety of deeper water as quickly as possible. We both experienced a sense of dread and terror. What was that giant thing? It was several times larger than the black bears that we have in Utah. And we don't have grizzly bears in Utah, but they're not that big either. We observed the creature for a couple of minutes until it walked into the darkness and left us alone on the lake. Yes, we were both terrified knowing that eventually we'd have to get out of the water and run up the hill to the car. We had no explanation for what we saw. Back then, I'd never heard of Bigfoot walking on all fours. Since that time, I've read numerous accounts of people seeing these things down on all fours. It's the only answer I can come up with to account for the massive size of the animal we saw. The experience we had on Strawberry that August night was the precursor for the year 2005, where everything changed and life has never been the same since. A door was opened somehow to extraordinary strangeness that I never asked for. I didn't seek and I can't seem to escape. This is the one and only time that I will record and recount these experiences. And I will do my best to give you a detailed account of what happened in our lives during 2005 and is subsequent to that time. It all began innocently enough on a late winter day when my wife and I decided to go for a drive to town to get a taco for lunch. On the return trip, we were two blocks south of Main Street in our small town, when suddenly a dog of some kind with short dark gray hair walked out into the street in front of us on two legs. And I slammed on the brakes as we watched this thing cross the road in disbelief. It ran into someone's yard, still on two legs, and went into the shrubbery and disappeared. Well, we were speechless. What the hell was that? We both said to each other. We went home and I got online and it didn't take long to find the numerous images and videos of these same dogs walking upright all over the southwest of the United States and down into Mexico. Some people refer to them as chupacabras. And all I know is we were both very upset by what we saw. A few weeks later, it was time for another friend and I to go on our first Jeep expedition of the season, and we headed south toward Utah's San Rafael Swell. It's some of the most remote country in the lower 48 states. On the way, we passed through San Pete Valley, where the second strange encounter took place. At the north end of the valley, there's a small town called Milburn, and just as we turned off the highway to head towards Milburn, there was a huge black figure standing in sagebrush at perhaps 60 yards away. I brought the jeep to a halt and we both stared at this thing with very broad shoulders and legs like tree trunks. We weren't close enough to make out any facial features, but we could see the glistening black hair that covered this being. It had a conical shaped head and a barrel chest and long arms and massive legs. Time stopped as we watched this thing for a few minutes and then it turned its body to the south, took two and a half steps, and it vanished. There was nowhere for it to hide. It didn't dash to a tree for cover or drop to the ground. It was midway into its third step with one leg raised and its foot up off the ground when it completely disappeared. It wasn't as though we watched it step into some unseen doorway where you'd observe the front part of the creature disappear, followed by its backside. No, it totally vanished in one instant of time in mid-stride. You can imagine the fear that swallowed us knowing we had to drive down the road where this thing was headed when it vanished. At that time, I had never researched anything about Bigfoot, though I was certainly familiar with the claims of those who had seen these things. I did not know there was a rich collection of encounters with these things vanishing from sight, but we both saw it one moment and the next it was gone. 
After the event concluded, we compared notes and both felt like it was nine feet tall and weighed perhaps as much as 600 pounds or more. It didn't make any aggressive movements toward us. However, we both felt a deep foreboding sense of evil. We couldn't shake that horrible feeling and we decided to postpone our Jeep adventure for another time. The next in our series of life-changing events occurred during the spring when we were doing some landscaping work in our yard. We lived a couple of miles outside of town and didn't have any close neighbors at the time. I hesitate to record this incredibly strange event because no one will believe me. But still, it was the most disturbing of events of 2005. And to leave a full and honest account, I'll tell you this part of my story. It still turns me inside out when I think about it. I'm shaking right now as I write. My oldest son was 17 at the time, and he was helping me with some landscaping work. We stopped for lunch, and while I was eating a sandwich in the house, I was looking into the backyard at our project and decided what we'd work on next when I saw a male American kestrel hawk flying toward a river birch tree in the back corner. Well, something was wrong with this bird, and I thought it was perhaps injured due to its erratic flight. But rather than landing in the tree, the small and colorful hawk landed on the ground, where we had been planting some barberry bushes, and it started moving its wings in a strange, unnatural way. And the next thing I knew, this bird pushed its wings up and away from its body in a manner that would be impossible for any bird to do, And then I was looking at something other than the hawk. More than 16 years have passed since this event occurred, and I no longer remember the exact order of what I witnessed. But over the next several minutes, I observed this thing change shapes into a rabbit with badly deformed ears, a squirrel that was incorrectly formed, a weasel, a marmot, and a badger, each of which was anatomically incorrect. At the same time as I witnessed this event, I was suddenly sick to my stomach and filled with nausea and a violent headache. The badger jumped down from the retaining wall and went over to a hole in the field. My son came upstairs at that point, and I asked him to keep watch on the hole while I went over there. I went over through the garage, and I picked up a stout club. When I got to the hole, nothing was there, and I retreated to the couch where I needed to rest for a few hours to recover. Later research uncovered a material known as black goo, or programmable matter, that might account for what I saw. Perhaps it was something from the military or the deep state. I don't know. Debilitating nausea continued for the next couple of weeks any time I went outside near where I'd seen that thing. Perhaps it was some kind of radioactivity. The next two events occurred on the same day. I was fly fishing with my partner at a still water known as Schofield Reservoir. It was a gorgeous late spring day and the fishing was good. The sky was a stunning azure blue with white fluffy clouds hanging low in the sky. At one point, I looked almost straight above me and gasped at seeing a very large silver sphere in the sky that appeared to be covered in radio towers. It was not very high above me as it was hovering between two of the low-hanging clouds, and as soon as I saw it, the thing rapidly ascended and was gone from sight in mere moments. Then, on the way home, as we left the mountains and reached Highway 6, we both saw a glowing orange orb coming toward us in the opposite lane of traffic. My friend commented that it was about the size of a basketball, We watched it pass us and turned to watch it go behind us, but it disappeared. Later that summer, my friend would fish at Indian Creek Bay on Strawberry Reservoir, where we saw two orbs the same evening. Our lives were becoming very weird. What in the world was happening to us? Well, this story is becoming so long, so I'll skip to the next orb story. It's not that critical. We finally reached July 4th. And after all the activities of the day, my wife and I were sitting on the back patio and watching fireworks in towns east of where we lived. 
We had an unobstructed view for many miles in every direction. After the fireworks ceased, we sat there enjoying the cool of the evening until almost midnight when she grabbed my arm and said, What is that? And pointing up the sky about halfway between our home and the mountains to the east. Neither of us spoke for a few minutes as we observed a huge triangular shaped craft move silently across the sky. It had running lights along the top and bottom edge of the side. And once it passed, we could see the back end, which also had running lights. It continued moving north until we lost sight of it. We were both two small-town kids that couldn't understand why these inexplicable things were happening to us. That was not the last unidentifiable thing we saw flying in the skies that year, but it was the most remarkable one of all. Sometime in August of 2005, my fishing partner called me late one evening and said to go outside and look above the prominent mountain in our valley. I did so, and to my surprise, there was a new bright star in the sky we'd never seen before, and it was flashing colors at an immense rate of change. My friend had the latest and most powerful camera with a fantastic zoom lens, and he filmed the star which not only flashed colors that we couldn't name, but changed shapes each time it flashed. We watched it in slow motion, and we were astonished by the revelation of what his camera brought into focus. Over the years since 2005, we've witnessed many such anomalies. By late September, the heat of the summer was behind us, and it was time to attempt the Jeep expedition once again. We made plans to explore a section of the San Rafael Swell we had never visited. On the drive to the Swell, we once again passed through the San Pete Valley and of course discussed the Bigfoot sighting from the spring. That was not my friend's first cryptid encounter, as I learned. After we passed the location of the sighting, we both gave an audible sigh of relief and proceeded on our way. And partway through the valley, we decided to explore a range of hills we'd never visited before, and we pulled onto a gravel road that led up into the hills. I stopped the jeep on a bridge over a small irrigation canal as we looked ahead trying to decide which way we wanted to go. It was 11 a.m., and that's when I noticed movement below me and to the left in my peripheral vision. When I looked directly at whatever had moved... I was instantly paralyzed with fear and incapable of movement or speaking. Time stopped and I couldn't even breathe. There below me kneeling in the canal was a monster covered in grizzled hair and a mixture of gray and light brown with golden yellowed colored eyes that were far apart and a wide mouth with narrow lips that were closed tightly together. I could not look away and I couldn't move and as time stood still, I had a long look at this thing. The hair on its forehead began at the brow ridge and grew upward on its forehead until it reached the top of its head that was cone-shaped. The hair was a uniform one inch in length. The hair on its face gave it a perfect full beard that grew up close to its eyes, leaving only a small patch of charcoal gray skin around the eyes. It never blinked. The nose was wider and flatter than a human nose, and hair grew across part of its nose. The space between the bottom of its nose and its upper lip was much wider than that of a human, at least twice as wide, maybe more. The shoulders on this beast were four feet wide and massive with muscle. The hair was longer on its shoulders, perhaps four inches long. There wasn't much neck to speak of, and it looked like its head rested on its shoulders. The head was too small to match the shoulders. Its chest was full and rounded and covered in hair and a couple of inches long. The shoulder muscles and biceps were incredibly huge. Because of its position in the canal, I couldn't see its elbows, lower arms, or hands. I also couldn't see below its chest. I never saw its legs at all. I have assumed all these years that as I was parked on the bridge and the motor was running, it must have disturbed the creature that may have been sleeping or resting under the bridge and it came out to investigate the source of the noise, but I'm just guessing. 
After taking a long look at this thing, I finally gained my composure enough to put the Jeep in reverse, take my foot off the clutch, and speed back down out of there. My friend said later he thought I was going to roll the Jeep, but he didn't know what I had seen, but he did see me staring out the window. I let out a scream as we backed down the steep road until we reached the pavement and drove away as fast as the Jeep would carry us. A couple of miles down the road, I pulled over and changed places with my friend as I was too impacted by the encounter to drive safely. This time we did go to the swell, but the trip was a bust for me due to what I had seen. What else did 2005 have in store for me? As it turned out, that was not the final strange experience of the year, but I won't recite the other UFO experiences. My poor wife was seeing them often in the mountains by our home, and it shook her to the core. I'd like to share some observations. Prior to these experiences, I had never seen anything unusual or out of place in my outdoor life. Suddenly, I knew the truth about things that most people will never know. Regarding the two clearly identifiable Bigfoot creatures, I've already said that the first black creature felt intensely evil, but I did not have the same feeling with the second grizzled one. Its face was eight to nine feet from my face, but it never grimaced at me or displayed any threatening behavior. It could have easily opened its mouth to growl at us and show its teeth, but its mouth remained closed. I was terrified and petrified with fear from simply seeing this monster up close, but I didn't feel any fear being projected from this creature, as many people report. If anything, it seemed to purposefully not do anything to terrorize us whatsoever. That being said, I've never been able to bring myself to visit that bridge again or camp out since 2005. Now, I still go fly fishing as often as health permits, but I never go unarmed if we're off the beaten path. And that's, that's the end of his email, but there's a postscript, and here's what he writes. In October of 2019, 14 years after the bridge sighting, I had another Bigfoot encounter at a small lake in northern Utah called Mill Hollow where I was fishing by myself. No one else was at the lake that day. I didn't have a visual this time, but a mature white fur was pushed over nearby and the creatures made a sound I can only describe as a symphony orchestra with all the string and wind and brass instruments striking a note together accompanied by multiple car horns. The loud noise lasted for a single quarter note. They had my attention. I assumed that rather than scream at me, they made this less threatening sound so not to alarm the numerous bull elk that are bugling in the mountains around me, and I suspect it was a hunting party and they wanted me gone. I gathered my fly rods and other gear and I left the area. I've read other people's accounts of these beings making all kinds of sounds, but I've never heard anyone report them sounding like a symphony orchestra. Last... In February of this year, 2021, one night at 12.30 a.m., something slapped the side of our home so hard that it felt like the house would come off its foundation. The slap was on the second floor on the other side of the wall from my head. It reverberated through the house and my youngest son in the basement called me wondering what had just happened. I instantly knew what had happened. One of the Bigfoot creatures that I had encountered found where I was living and must have climbed up the rock chimney and let me know they knew where I was. So many people have reported such events of being harassed by these creatures that I wasn't surprised, but I took measures to hopefully keep it from happening again. I hate the feeling of being a marked man. Oh man, that's the end, that's the end of the postscript. That's a, that last paragraph gives me the creeps. Woo! What a what an amazing set of events in this man's life. And this is the one and only time he's going to record or recount this. And all I, I can't add anything to the story, but I can tell the man thank you for thinking of me and sending the email to me to share with this audience because we love these great stories. I know they're unsettling to the people that they happen to, but we love hearing them. 
and so I appreciate the gentleman. Uh, he never said whether to use his name or not, so I'm not going to. But it's just a wonderful story, and I and I got this back in 2021, and I'm just now getting to it. So I hope the man is still listening. I hope he's not dealing too terribly bad with MS and was able to hear this story. And I'm sure, I'm sure it's helping some other people. Okay, thank you, sir, for the story. From the Journal of Private George Gall, 112th Regiment, U.S. Army. These documents were stolen from a secure vault in Fort Leavenworth Prison, Kansas City, Kansas, in 1974. It is November 12, 2019 at the time of this posting. George Gall would be almost 100 years old now. The U.S. Army has no record of George Gall serving in the years in question. We believe he is still being held in Fort Leavenworth Prison. Stamped on the stolen file is Prisoner 9122557, Top Secret, Filed 26 June 1950. Note to reader, I have transposed the journal entries from manuscript to a digital Word file. The original manuscript is locked away. Journal Entry 24 September 1949. We left Kansas in a plane two hours ago. It's good to be out of Leavenworth and breathing free air. This plane is uncomfortable and cold. We're en route to Europe, I heard one of the officers say Poland. We are a sorry looking lot of criminals. Everyone on this plane has been sentenced to death, but the sentences have been commuted if we agree to this mission. We don't know what the mission is. I suppose we'll find out soon enough. It's better than being hung or shot, though. I was a demolition specialist before I killed that officer. I guess they need someone to blow something up. Journal Entry 29 September 1949 We arrived yesterday at dark. The town we flew into was big. I heard the word Stroysen. There was a lot of traffic as we left the city into the countryside in a deuce and a half. We've been told not to ask questions and not to associate with locals. The truck ride beat us to death. Some roads are still not repaired from the war. It took four hours to get here. I don't know where we are. The place was abandoned by the Poles years ago. Maybe a plague. The Germans built concrete structures underground in 1942. This place isn't even on our maps, but here we are. The old German facility and the little town are abandoned. We are the first to arrive. We have Captain Decker. He's in charge of security. Dr. Smith, who's in charge of something. And Major Flynn, he's in charge of everything, whatever that might be. For the time being, I have only spoken to Captain Decker. He wouldn't tell me why we're here or what the mission is. Fifteen men here. No one answers my questions. Journal Entry 3, October 1949 More men arrived the last couple of days. We're close to 80 in total. Criminal, soldiers, and scientists. I don't know what's going on, but apparently we're waiting for more men and supplies. And then we go to work. Something feels off. Journal Entry 9, October 1949 Today, Major Flynn gave us a heads up. Not much detail. Seems like we're after something the Germans left behind. We don't know what or where. It's important to them, though. So important, they burned the whole city when we arrived. It's smoldering days later. The town had been abandoned. Not much of a loss. I've been speaking with some of the new guys, and most of them are all sentenced to death. 
Everyone was sentenced for different crimes, but we were all about to go to the wall and be shot when we were offered this mission. I was assigned to a squad earlier today. We're a bunch of misfits and deviants. Every man here is a criminal. Most are murderers. I've met a couple of arsonists. The firebugs give me the creeps. Dutch was named squad leader, the highest NCO among us. He knew the job well enough, so no one said a word. Killers being led by a killer. This should go real well. Journal Entry 11, October 1949 We finally went on patrol to the abandoned German structure. It felt like it was back in the war. The woods around the place look exactly like Belgium during the Battle of the Bulge. The only difference is the weather. It was freezing back there. It's not too bad here. We're armed for combat on this little secret mission. Lots of boom booms and bang bangs. We loaded up on as many rounds and grenades as we could carry. Old habits die hard. Especially when you've been in a fight. I don't know what we're looking for here. As we were leaving camp, I turned around and gave it a good look. The barracks at the back, the mess hall next to them, the officer's quarters and all the shit we brought with us. The place had grown in the two weeks since we arrived. Trenches surround the town and the concrete structures. Me and Jenkins dropped inside to check, but we found nothing interesting. The tunnels were blown out and blocked, so we left. We did a sweep of the town. Everything was burned. I walked inside one of the houses it used to be, and I kicked a skeleton. Only thing was left was bones and a rusty luger next to a skull. What happened here? Journal Entry 23 October 1949 Our squad is overseen patrolling around the town for days. We wake up, we have some chow, and then patrol the same trails we were on yesterday and the days before. We come back at dusk and we get some chow and repeat the process. We're not the only ones doing it, though. I spoke with some men from another squad watching the west flank. One of them told me that we're searching for something the Nazis were trying to use for the war. Maybe a weapon. I didn't care. If I hadn't come along, I'd be a dead man by now. I finally heard Dutch's story today. He was the only survivor of a plane crash on D-Day. The Germans were looking for survivors, so he hid under rubble and the bodies of his buddies for three days. Our boy showed up and he came out. I understand why it affected him mentally. Anyone else would have killed themselves, but he survived it. I don't think I could have done it. Last night, I overheard some doctors talking about something called Project Morphous. They said that we're close to finding something. We aren't supposed to ask questions, but as days pass, I'm beginning to wonder, what exactly are we looking for? Journal Entry, 23 November 1949 I haven't been on patrol in weeks. My squad has become manual labor. We've been digging, day in and day out. We eat, sleep, and dig. Two weeks ago, Major Woodward gave the order to start digging. We haven't stopped since. I wish they would call in some heavy equipment. This would go a lot faster. But it's the Army. The word is we're searching for the right bunker. We found several structures, but when we get close to clearing the dirt away, the structure collapses. We move to a new site. They've ordered some of the manual labor into town to begin excavating there. Maybe we'll find what we're looking for. This is killing me. Journal Entry 1 December 1949 We found it. I guess it's the one the scientists have been looking for. A herd of team in white lab coats went in. They spent two days hauling stuff out. 
we weren't allowed to observe. Earlier today, me and other demolition guys went down the hole and placed explosives in the bunker. It was close to a yard of concrete in the walls and ceiling. Nothing well-placed charges couldn't handle. The whole valley roared with the explosion, and I must say that after digging like crazy, blowing something up was great. Journal Entry, 18 December, 1949 The whole town is slowly becoming an experiment. We haven't seen any of the scientists in weeks. They're all down in another bunker inside the town. We've seen trucks loaded with machinery and mysterious boxes come in and out. The genius has figured out that heavy equipment will make this all go faster. We're a mile away from the town, but when you lay on your head on your bed, you can hear the machines digging. Journal Entry, 24 December, 1949 It's Christmas, and snow's been falling. It's gotten deep outside. Now it's like the bulge. We're not allowed to send or receive letters, so the Major decided to throw a party for everybody. We have some booze, and we're having turkey later today. Journal Entry 2 January 1950 Last night an earthquake caught us sleeping. We jumped out of our bunks and looked outside. Lights were coming from the town. A beam made of colors like a rainbow was swirling in the sky. The light grew bright and blinded us. Then it was gone. I couldn't see much for the rest of the night, but my eyes are improving. We asked some of the officers about those lights, and the answer we got was, what lights? Most of us were deemed paranoid or with some mental disorder. We were all given meds each day. None of us took them. I would find little pills scattered all over. Made me laugh, but the officers never said anything about it. What were those lights? Journal Entry, 5 January 1950 Four days ago, a patrol squad vanished. We couldn't find them or make radio contact. They were found late today. Some supply guys stumbled on them. They were covered with snow, not obvious to anyone. Soon the corpses were hauled into camp. I looked at them. And they were ripped to pieces. Officers say it was a pack of wolves. I knew wolves didn't do that to people. No predator rips bodies apart like that without eating them. A sense of dread washed over the camp and morale dropped like a hammer. What had killed all these men? Journal Entry 7 January 1950 There have been more killings around the camp. Everyone is afraid to go on patrol now. We don't know what the hell's going on. Every night, someone disappears, and every day we find a new corpse somewhere. All of them look the same. They're eyeless, gutless, and tongueless, ripped to pieces. Some are decapitated. The Major has ordered every man to perimeter duty. Night watch is a rotation system. I was on watch every five days. Now it's every other night. We've dug foxholes and we've pulled out the big guns. Fifty cows are placed at fifty-yard intervals. We all carry double ammo on watch. Nothing has approached. I hope it stays quiet. Journal Entry, 11 January, 1950 Tonight we saw it. We saw the thing that's been killing our guys. It was nothing made by God. It attacked a patrol that was about to enter the wire. As soon as we saw it, we opened fire. Hundreds of rounds were fired at this thing. Someone had to have hit it. Every time I close my eyes, I still see the fire of the machine gun lighting up that thing. It had long arms and short legs, and it was hairless and had dark skin. And the sound it made it was very strange. We managed to pull two men away from the attack and inside the wire. They're in pretty bad shape. 
One of them is unconscious and the other was bitten on the arm. Right now he's delusional with fever, probably an infection from that animal. He keeps saying over and over, he's coming, he's coming. I couldn't sleep all night. At first light, my squad left to search for the monster. We didn't find it, but we found the trail of blood it left. The blood was black like crude oil. What are we doing here? Journal Entry, 12 January 1950 Another earthquake woke us, and like the last time, a beam of light turned the night to day for a second. I closed my eyes before it blinded me again. It was a good move. Davis, the guy we rescued yesterday, he killed himself. He smashed his head against the floor of the nursery. I didn't know a human could kill himself that way. Nicholson, he's the unconscious guy. Well, he was gone. He had totally vanished. Later, we found him in the shower. He had cut his own throat with a knife. And on the shower wall, in blood, he had written with his finger, He's coming. I've been afraid before, but never like this. Journal Entry, 27 January, 1950 Things have gone from bad to worse. No one patrols at night anymore. When the sun goes down, we all jump into our foxholes and load our rifles and freeze all night and pray nothing comes for us. But the killing continues. We found two missing men today. Something ripped out their hearts and took their heads. Their weapons were scraps of twisted metal and broken wood covered with a thick red slime. No one dares to sleep more than three hours a day. Something's hiding there, and we want to be ready when it comes. There's a lot of veterans of the war here. Some fought in the bulge with me, and some fought in the Pacific. We've all seen war, and we've faced death and seen the horrors. But now, we're afraid of something else. You can feel it. Men who fought with me say that we're back in the bulge, and I say that too. The only difference is, instead of fighting Nazis... We're fighting monsters. Journal Entry 30, January 1950 We kill one of those things today. It tried to sneak inside the wire. I was sleeping when the 50 cows woke me up, and I rushed outside with my rifle. Then the firing ceased. I saw the guys all staring at something, and I walked for a closer look. I'm not sure what it was. The guys fired a hundred bullets at it, but it was still alive. It was twitching. I emptied the magazine into it, but it still didn't die. And with a sudden jerk, it launched at the man closest to it. The monster swiped at the soldier and missed, but he hit his rifle and cut it in half with his claws. Someone showed up with a flamethrower. Hell, I didn't know we even had flamethrowers. We backed up and he covered that thing with fire. The roar of the flames and the screeches of that monster as it burned are noises I will never forget. We got to figure out a way to get out of here. God help us all. Journal Entry, 6 February, 1950. Today, they brought one of the scientists back. He had been working in town in one of the bunkers. I saw him as they rushed him to the nursery. He was missing an arm. Hours later, we heard him scream the same words others had said before they killed themselves. He's coming, he said. I'm not staying to find out who he is. I overheard some of the guys planning to desert. Going with them is another death sentence, though, if I get caught. Where would I go if we got away? I'm thinking ahead for the first time in my life. This place is a nightmare. I don't know how I'm going to get out of here. Journal Entry 8 February 1950 Major Flynn captured half the deserters three miles from camp a few hours later. He sentenced them to death. 
everyone was forced to witness their execution by firing squad. That could have been me standing there. I was included in a patrol today to find the other deserters. It didn't take long to find them. We followed their tracks another two miles, and their mangled corpses were laying close together in a clearing, a giant red stain in the pristine white forest snow. When is this going to end? Journal Entry 20, February 1950 Yesterday, 40 more men showed up. They're regular infantry, not criminals like us. They're gung-ho to get into a fight, but they don't realize that they've been sent into hell. They found out when the Major sent them in squads to patrol different areas around the town. I think the strategy was if one squad gets taken out by the creature, the other three would make it. Some made it back alive, but most didn't. The soldiers who walked back were showing signs of going mad like the others. They will soon be dead, too, by their own hands. And as days go by, I wonder if God is watching us. I don't think he is. Journal Entry 22, February 1950 I'm losing my mind in this God-forsaken place. Last night, I had a dream. I was floating somewhere, and it was cold, dark, and empty. I felt a hand on my neck and a voice said, I'm coming for you all. I woke up and I had a black mark on my neck. It was like the black crude type blood we found weeks before. It wouldn't wash off. I went for some chow and saw that every soldier has the same mark on his neck. I'm hearing the voice in my head now. It's coming from the town, coming from that old bunker. Journal Entry 1 April 1950 Men are now being killed one by one. I'm losing my mind. The demons are roaming the perimeter, killing everyone they can get their hands on. There's more than one. We're beginning to lose it. I hear him getting closer and closer, and I hear the same words over and over and over. I'm coming. Journal Entry 9 April 1950 We found Barnaby dead on the bathroom floor today. He smashed his head against the wall. I still hear the voice. Journal Entry 12 April 1950 There are fewer of us each day. Captain Decker killed himself this morning. Dutch disappeared last night, and Powers is in the nursery after something tore his arm off. I'm losing track of the days. The Major disappeared last night. He went straight into that evil town. Now there are only a few of us left. We're running low on ammo and food. God help us, he's coming. Journal Entry 15, April 1950 There are five of us left. All the others have killed themselves or have been killed by the monsters now roaming inside the perimeter. I'm in hell and God has forsaken me, and I'm going to die a terrible death. I have no will to fight. It's hopeless. He's coming. Journal Entry 18 April 1950 He came today. Everything is going dark. I'm about to die. Journal Entry 24 June 1950 I think I survived. I don't know how I got here or how long I've been here. This hospital is bright and white. Soft sheets on soft beds. No one is in the room with me. There's an animal smell in the room. I've smelled it before. I'm not sure where. I can smell the nurse's perfume in the hallway. That's weird. I hear English spoken outside the room. 
Maybe I'm back in the States. A nurse just peeked in on me and smiled. He's awake, doctor, I heard her say. Later, three officers entered my room with their assistants. There was standing room only. They stared at me like looking at an animal at the zoo. Do you know what you are? asked the senior officer. I'm alive, I said. But do you know what happened and what you are? What was he talking about? I shut my mouth. That's always best when the questions come from officers. A mirror was on the nightstand, and I raised my hand to reach it, but restraints held my arm tight to the bed. I hadn't noticed them. Where my hand should have been, a bony, gnarled, Oh God, that's not my hand. It's a monster's hand. What the hell is this? I struggled with the restraints. An officer nodded at the nurse. She held the mirror in front of me. That's not me, I said. That's not me. I was filled with rage and I growled at the humans and I fought against the restraints. The nurse ran to my side and injected me and all faded to black again. Final journal entry, 25 June 1950. I'm back at Leavenworth in a cell in solitary. I hear no noises. I'm alone, and I'm hungry. Thanks for listening to this podcast. I really appreciate you. You'll see on the end screen here a button for the Steve Lilly Journals channel. You can click on it, subscribe, click the bell icons, so that when I launch that podcast, you'll get notified. I'll announce it here, but you'll get notified too across YouTube. So I appreciate you, and we'll see you guys on the next video. Thanks. Thanks.